As we acknowledge the land today, let's allow ourselves to slow down for a moment and ground ourselves here. You might even close your eyes and take a breath. And you can notice how your body is anchored here, wherever you may be, anchored by the force of gravity. And we notice the land itself and we can feel how it supports us and holds us. And we recognize that indigenous peoples have served as keepers of this land for thousands of years, long before European settlers came and began colonizing it. Indigenous communities continue this stewardship of the land, even as the momentum of colonization plows forward. So let us be mindful of these realities, informing our words and actions with the spirit of truth and reconciliation. We're hosted on the lands of the Mississaugas of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Wendat. We also recognize the enduring presence of all First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples. We honor the light of creation alive in their hearts. And on this United Nations International Day for the Eradication of Poverty, we consider how the light of Christ calls us to share what we have for the health of all creation. And we pray that we might be a part of the work of the divine healer. Oh, divine healer, we confess that sometimes we yearn for you to wave a magic wand on our wounded lives, to remove our pain, illness, and suffering. We hear the gospel story of the one seeking healing from Jesus and assume you will perform a similar miracle for all of us if we just pray hard enough. And we do pray. Open our eyes to recognize the teachings and tools you have given us with which to seek healing. In the midst of our afflictions and diseases, you whisper to us that wholeness requires self-care and rest. You nudge us toward caregivers who can support and advise us. You breathe into us energy to move and stretch and reach toward health. You place in us an urgency to seek justice so that all may enjoy adequate health, care. Renew our spirits in the midst of our diseases and afflicting spirits. Transform us, O oh Holy One, for the health of your creation. And so, my friends, we find ourselves together through prayer, wherever we are joining this service this morning. We're grateful to have a few with us in person and preparing for opening, reopening for worship next week. But we hold space for the light of welcome to meet you wherever you are. And if you're at home, we hope you'll light a candle and find yourself drawing closer to the heart of God. We also light our memorial lights whenever we gather to remember those who aren't with us, but who are with us in spirit. And the Refugee Support Committee has been walking with one of our newcomers, Ashraf, as he lost his mother this week in Syria. And so we hold space and prayers for their family. And so the lights find us. No matter how long they stay lit, they're always with us, and they call us to actions of gratitude. Let's join in our opening hymn, Now Thank We All Our God.
I don't know if you still have your Thanksgiving pumpkins, but we have symbols of the harvest still with us this morning. And the children in Godly Play have been adding to this pumpkin for a couple of weeks their drawings and their words and prayers of thanksgiving. And there's an invitation to do that on your own pumpkin as you head towards Halloween. But we are marking the path of gratitude as followers of Jesus. And on this path, when we think of harvest, we can't help but not think of the water that gives life. We can't not help but give thanks for the waters of creation. These are the waters that God called Moses to lead the people through to freedom. These are the waters of Jesus' baptism, and today they are the waters of Ariel and her dad John's baptism. And so we hold space with gratitude in our hearts for the gift of life and the symbol of baptism that reminds us that we are all beloved. Yeah, you guys. As Ariel is brought forward by her parents, I just want you to see at home a picture of her as a baby. She's running and starting to talk to us in her own language, but we just invite her family forward with a sense of prayer and blessing. And what a gift on this day. John, you may not know that your spiritual meaning of your name means gift of God, God's precious gift. So I know that you said it's Ariel's day, but today you also get to be honored and blessed. So I'll get, John, if you want to stand right here with Aaron, and James is going to introduce you. On behalf of Islington United Church, I present Ariel Kayla Weir and her father, John Weir, for baptism. Surrounded by the love of mom and partner Aaron and family and friends here in the sanctuary and those joining via live stream. I know, Ariel wants to run. It's okay, guys. Hi. John and Aaron, I know that you are here on faith as you've watched her grow. And so I ask you, do you believe in God, the creator, source of life and love? Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the one who shows us the way of peace? Do you believe in the Holy Spirit who sustains us when we need strength? 
If so, please respond, I do by the grace of God. And so I ask, will you follow in the way of Jesus, one who shows us how to love and serve our neighbor, and join with this church family to celebrate God's presence and be part of building a world that's just and fair? If so, please respond, I will, God being my helper. Church, you know the courage it takes for families to be offering themselves into God's care. And so I ask you to stand as you're part of this blessing today. It's okay if you want to walk around. Yeah, look at all these new family members. So church, you've heard the promises of John and Aaron. Will you commit yourselves to supporting and nurturing this family within a community that loves and serves in Christ's name? Will you promise to love and support and care for them? And will you let them make their own way as they are welcomed into this family of Christ? If so, please respond, we will with God's help. We will with God's help. Amen. You may be seated. Now, Ariel, I know you're dying to see this. You want to come and touch the water? Yeah, come here. I'm going to show you. Okay, hi. Nice to see you. Watch this. It's a big day. This is just like the water in your bath, only it's the water of blessing today. And I baptize you in the name of God, the Father, Creator, in the name of Jesus, our friend, the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, who is with us, a sustainer and friend. And I mark you with the sign of the cross, and I claim you as God's own forever yeah and you know what now we're gonna bless your dad you want to stay with me and we'll do that john it's my privilege to welcome you to this family of faith to bless you in the name of god who created you to bless you in the name of jesus the son to bless you in the name of the holy spirit your strength and i mark you with the sign of the cross and I claim you as Christ's own forever to be strengthened and to share that love with your family and with the world. And all the people said, Amen. We welcome you by name so that you will know who you are. We welcome you in Christ's name so that you will know whose you are. You will always have a place here. And your mom, she's going to hold this and remind you of what happened today. And remember... God loves you. Ariel and John, this is the day that your light shines a little bit brighter. Remember that you're both children of God and you will always be filled with the light of Christ. We'll change that light now so you can take these candles home as a reminder of your baptism. This God light bless. never goes out. It's only changed. You take it and let this song be a blessing for you as you find your way back to your seat, okay? Good morning. Hear these ancient words from Isaiah 62. The vindication and salvation of Zion. 
For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her vindication shines out like the dawn and her salvation like a burning torch. The nations shall see your vindication and all the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken, and your land shall no more be termed desolate. But you shall be called, My delight is in her, and your land married. For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. Herein lies wisdom. Thanks be to God. God is our refuge, God is our strength, God is our refuge, God is our strength. Hear this, all you people. Give ear, all who inhabit the world. You of both low and high estate, rich and poor together. My mouth shall speak words of wisdom. The thoughts of my heart are full of understanding. I will turn my mind to a proverb and with harp and song declare its meaning. God is our refuge. God is our strength. Why should I fear when the days are evil, when the wicked stalk my steps and harass me? They are people who trust in their wealth and boast of their abundant riches. We see that the wise die as well as the foolish and stupid. They perish, leaving their wealth to others. But wealth cannot redeem anyone or pay God the value of a person's own life. The tomb is their final home and their dwelling place forever, though once they call the states by their own names. Like sheep, they head for the tomb with death as their shepherd. But God will ransom my life from the power of the grave. God will save me. God is our refuge. God is our strength. Words of good news from the Gospel of Mark. Chapters 5, verses 21 to 43. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue, named Jairus, came and said when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And so he went with him. And a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been enduring suffering from hemorrhaging for 12 years. She'd endured much under many physicians and had had all she had had spent all she had and was still no better. Rather, she grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak, for she said, If I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately, her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately, aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say, Who touched me? 
He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down in front of him and told him the whole story. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people wailing and weeping loudly. When they entered, he said to them, Why do you make such a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. And they put him all outside, and he took the child's father and mother and those who were with him, and they went in to see the child. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, get up. And immediately, the girl got up and began to walk around. She was 12 years of age. At this, they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that they should tell no one. And he told them, give her something to eat. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Excuse me. On this day, this United Nations Day for the Eradication of Poverty, we're privileged to be able to welcome the very Reverend, the Right Honorable Lois Wilson as our guest preacher. Lois comes to us with many remarkable honors to her name, and so many of them are firsts. As very reverent, she was the first female moderator of the United Church of Canada from 1980 to 1982. She went on to become the first Canadian as a president of the World Council of Churches for eight more years. During much of this time, Lois also served as a senator in our Canadian government. She has been awarded the, the Order of Canada, first as an officer, later as a companion. And most recently, Lois has been leading a group on behalf of our national church, made up of representatives from each province and territory to promote the adoption of a guaranteed livable income for those in need. This is the way that our church is meeting the problem of poverty, of providing social justice to an issue that is so starkly apparent to us now. This morning, we welcome Lois to perhaps to another first for her, her first visit to Islington, to share her experiences and wisdom and to inspire us all. Lois. I greet you in the name of Jesus Christ, whose body we are and bring you greetings from some other members of the body. I think of the Presbyterian Church in the Republic of South Korea, who gave me this beautiful stole, which I wear because it covers everything. I think of the Church of the Cherubim and Seraphim in Africa, one of the newly independent churches which grew up quite apart from the missionary movement. And I think of all the other African churches that the United Church works with to establish safe houses for gays and lesbians all over that continent. 
So we bear the members of all those congregations in our prayers, and we expect them to bear us up in their prayers as well. Well, COVID has been a major interruption in our lives and a major crisis. But in the Chinese language, crisis also means opportunity. And that's what I want to speak about today. In the New Testament, uh, the three Gospels all tell the same story of interruption and possibility that uh, was read this morning. It's the story of the healing of Jairus' daughter and the woman with the flow of blood. Let me begin by saying this is not history and it is not biography. It is, um, it is called gospel. It is a, a literary genre, which is different. When you pick up the newspaper, you don't expect the same thing from the editorial as you do from the comics, as you do from the opinion piece. And in the same way, there are different kinds of literature in the Bible. And the one we, we read from today is called gospel, which means good news. And it is basically the reflection of the early church community on the life of Jesus and what it meant, the person of Jesus. The reflecting on this is what it means when the Messiah comes into the world. It's more powerful than biography because conviction is added to it. So it's about Jesus' encounter with women of very different backgrounds. One was Jairus' daughter, a daughter of privilege, who was 12 years old, and the other is a woman who has had a flow of blood for 12 years, and she's been poor and ostracized. Now, the fact that they both have something to do with 12 is symbolic, because 12, biblically speaking, it means wholeness, totality, completeness, 12 tribes of Israel, 12 disciples, 12 gates to the city. So this story, this gospel, is something to do with wholeness. So this interruption proposes new relationships. Story begins with Jesus at the seashore, where he was quite often, among the Oklos, that is, the, among the street people, the illegal immigrants, the ones that don't have a home. And he is approached by Jairus, a man of wealth, a big man in the synagogue, a man of privilege, who comes and says to Jesus, my daughter is near death. And he'd heard of Jesus. Could you come and help her? So Jesus and Jairus set out. Now, it's very interesting. Here, Mark interrupts the story. And as I've said, an interruption or a crisis makes new possibilities. Story number two starts, and it is about a woman who has had a flow of blood for 12 years. She's poor. She's unclean because of the blood, because blood, menstrual blood was thought to be unclean. And she has no way of participating in the community in a full way. She is, in fact, isolated. She's barren in a culture that does not prize barrenness, but prizes fertility. So she's got three strikes against her. And we all know that inclusion in the community is important to mental health. COVID has taught us that. So the woman is desperate, and she joins the crowd from behind. She doesn't dare approach Jesus from the front. And it says, you know, she, she kind of sidles up to him and, and thinks to herself, if I can only touch his shawl, then I will be healed. Now, this is not a magic thing. The shawl represents the Jewish prayer shawl, which goes away back to the time of Moses and represents the whole history of liberation of the Jewish people. 
And she knows if she can touch it, that will put her into the tradition of Jewish people, of liberation, to which she belongs. So it's an audacious act. She squeezes herself, she touches the prayer shawl, and immediately Jesus said, who touched me? And she has to admit it was her. She told him then what had happened. And his response is interesting. He says, daughter, your faith has made you whole. Go in peace, free forever from this disease. Now that's the rendering in the Revised Standard Version. But if you look up all the other ways this verse is translated, it's, it's interesting because it's really critical to how you understand this story. Whether it's an impossible magician's trick that really challenges your intellectual life or whether it's something else. The J.B. Phillips translation has, your willingness to risk has made you whole. I want to ask Ted Scott, the primate of the Anglican Church, what's the difference between faith and belief? He says, well, imagine yourself at Niagara Falls and a man says, you know, I've strung a guy wire across the falls and do you, do you believe I can go across that and not fall in? You say, I believe that, that's belief. But if he turns to you and says, hop on my shoulders and I'll take you across, that's faith. <laughs> faith is putting yourself into it, not just an intellectual thing. So here the Jerusalem Bible says, your faith has restored you to health free of your complaint. The King James Version has healed of that plague. The Asian women theologians with whom I in touch said, their translation is, go in wholeness, freed forever from your bondage. And what is their bondage? The exclusion from community. She's broke. And Jesus has restored her to community. So what's happening in this story? Healing in its broadest sense, body, mind, and spirit. Jesus certainly manifested spiritual power, but he was not a magician whose powers contradict our reason. He healed the whole person, body, mind, and spirit by restoring her to community. I was once appointed to the World Council of Churches Medical Commission, and I said, what, what am I doing on that? Because I'm not a doctor, I have no training in medicine. Well, they said, you're a, you're a minister, and that means you're there to represent the congregation as healing community. Realizing that when we get sick, it's not just physical, but it has many community manifestations as well. And the healing tradition is still in the churches in the more holistic way. First time I saw it was in a Methodist church in India, in Delhi, way back in 1975. And they had healing built into their service. Second time I saw it was here in Toronto in the Metropolitan Community Church, which is the church founded by Brent Hawks and ministers mainly to gay and lesbians. And in every service, which I go to occasionally, the elders line up at the front with oil, and people who feel they are in need of healing are invited to come up for a blessing, and they come. And some words are spoken to them, and they're anointed with oil. And it's very interesting, because these people know, know that they are in need of healing, of mind and spirit, and perhaps of body. And the laying on of hands in the healing ceremony is important. We recognize it in the ordination of ministers when the laying on of hands is, is, is practiced, realizing that energy, energy is communicated through that. So the woman has that encounter with Jesus. Then Mark picks up the first story, which is interrupted, which is Jairus' daughter, and he goes back with Jairus to his house and uh, he says your little daughter is not dead she's only asleep and she goes over to the little girl and says get up she's 12 years old 
and she is restored to wholeness and to the community. And then instead of saying, fall on your knees and give thanks, he says, give her something to eat, she's hungry. So what does this story mean? What do I think Mark put it there? As I say, it came out of the reflection of the early church about the meaning of Jesus. I think it means that the center, the people at the center of a society cannot be made whole until those at the edge are reconnected to community as full participants. If this is the meaning, then what lessons have we during these COVID days? I watched a TVO program moderated by Steve Pakin some time ago on COVID. And they were going on and on about how, you know, the poor you have with you always, you always have the poor. And they had no idea where it came from. So I was so mad, I, I sent an email to Steve Pakin and I said, that quote is from the book of Deuteronomy in a book called the Bible, but you've only, you've only quoted half of it. The full quote is, the poor you have with you is always because you do not keep my commandments. He thanked me vociferously and said he would never quote it again unless he quoted the whole thing. So our situation now is that COVID has shown up the cracks in our social system and that there are many people who have not received salaries and are poor among us and they're unable to participate in the community some are too poor to have a smartphone or a computer. And I noticed already the pushback against Ontario where you can download vaccination things for people who don't know how to do that. Are we able to affirm that the setting free and the insecurity of the poor, the isolated, the Aboriginal people, the street people, those on the edge must happen before those of us who are more at the center are free to live in wholeness. COVID-19 has been a major interruption and a crisis. Might it mean also a fundamental change in our relationships between those at the center and those at the edge? Now, I know that the Christian church has been responsible, I think, for the whole image of let's give hampers to the poor, let's give them handouts, let's give them a hand up when they need it. I think that what I want to talk about is a little different. Since 1972, the United Church of Canada has had a policy supporting something called the Guaranteed Livable Income. And they renewed that in 1986. In other words, the General Council passed a resolution and sent it to Ottawa and nothing happened. So about a year ago, September, I had a call from the national office saying, we would like to try a different method. Uh, this has been our policy and it's really needed now. Uh, would you please see if you can animate a network of individuals across the church who would lobby the government for a guaranteed livable income? So we went to work needing and knowing that we needed a, a, a reformation of our economic and social institutions as Medicare was at one point. We now have individuals in churches in every province in Canada, uh, in some places more than others, in Toronto quite a number. And uh, last April the 8th, which was the day before the Liberal Convention, we, we had visits and vigils outside uh, MPs' offices, no matter what their political stripe, saying that the United Church was in favor of a guaranteed livable income. Uh, the Anglicans and Lutherans and Catholics have all made, made policy motions about this, but they've not yet gone to the network model. So they're not getting any response from Ottawa. Now mind you, neither have we yet but we have people within uh, who are able to tell us what's going on. And apparently on April the 7th, which was the meeting of the Liberal Party before their, before their uh, 
policy thing, the guaranteed livable income was the highest thing that was discussed. It was very high on their agenda, although it has not yet made it to the policy, policy level. So we're hopeful. We have now um, in, invited all United Churches across the country to dedicate their service this morning to informing people about the guaranteed livable income. And quite a few have, have responded. Um, it was, I think it was best illustrated under Kathleen Wynne's government when Hugh Siegel, who is a conservative senator, wrote the background for the guaranteed livable income, which you can find on the internet, the rationale for it, and presented it to the uh, Wynne's government, which adopted it, and they had three pilot projects, um, one in Thunder Bay, one in Hamilton, and one in Lindsay. And I have lived in Thunder Bay and Hamilton, so I know people there very well and have talked to them. Basically, the idea was to roll over and extend things like CERB and other monies that the government has given to support people in need during COVID, to extend that and make a permanent policy of giving uh, money to people on a monthly basis who earn more, less than $2,000 a month. Uh, it would be based on the tax rule, so everybody would not get the same. It would be according to your needs. But it would come automatically. You don't have to go and apply for it. I mean, I don't have to keep telling everybody that I'm over 65, and every month my pension rise, and I depend upon it. And that's the same kind of thing that we're advocating for the poor, for people with less than $2,000 a month. Um, McMaster University evaluated the experiment in Hamilton, and it was uniformly positive. One old lady said, now I can go and get my teeth fixed. Another said, now I feel secure enough that I can go out and get a better job. So people did not stay home and just wait for a check to arrive. It gave them some confidence to enter into the fuller community. And that has been true across the board. Unfortunately, after a year and a half, the pilot projects were, were stopped by the Ford government. Um, since then, the only province that has really been active on it is PEI. And this has been a push for the guaranteed livable income in that province from all three parties. So it's not a partisan political thing at all. It's, a, it's a, something that needs to be done because of the wreckage that has descended upon us because of the COVID-19. And you all know people who have not been paid. Uh, the, the, arts, the arts, for example, have taken a hit. The restaurants, business, and so on. So what we're going to do is um, keep at it. It took uh, 20 years for us to get Medicare, so we don't know how long this will happen, but we're going to keep at it, A, because the gospel dictates it. It's not the Lady Bountiful approach. It's allowing people to stand on their own feet and to access what they need. And that's why I commend it to you. So COVID has given us this opportunity, and a crisis is always an opportunity. There are great blessings and interruptions. There might even be good news to the poor. Amen.
At his house I saw Jesus go to break bread, and I knew something special had happened that day. When Zacchaeus gave half of his riches away, and with God the world is turned upside down, the poor are embraced and the lost they are found. Let's work for the Lord, we're all people of free, when it's good to feel good about God, loving you. Friends, join me as we pray together now. Loving God, we thank you for the ways you continue to provide for us. Help us to recognize that in your provision, you are also equipping us to share with others. Give us faith to step out into service. Guide our hearts and our eyes to areas of need and guide our hands to care for the most vulnerable. Eradicate greed from our hearts as we work to eradicate poverty from the world. And remind us, God, that through Jesus, whatever we do to the least of us, we do to you. Give us strength and courage to use our gifts as you would have us use them. Let us go to our work and into our relationships stimulated by hope, strengthened by faith and guided by your love to play our part in the liberation of all people. We pray this together as we follow in the way of Jesus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I feel grateful today to be part of a community that cares, that makes room for generosity and is willing to lift others up when they need it and to be lifted up when we need it. And so I just ask today for you to continue to be part of the practice of generosity, uh, people giving through e-transfer to office at islingtonunited.org, writing their checks or putting in offering, people dropping it off at the door of the church, knowing that together we're making a difference in this community and learning along the way. I invite you to offer your gifts as the staff singers share with us a call to generosity. Anytime, anytime. 
I wish you could see Ariel just sleeping right through that. <laughs> just the amazingness that settles when we're together and that peace that finds us in the high notes and the quiet. One of our uh, volunteer associate ministers had a birthday this week. She's in the balcony. She's one of the ones who will continue to love our children as they grow. And so we'd want to say happy birthday to Amy Crawford. And today, uh, Nancy Yacobucci has a birthday and Jeremy Vickers turns 26. And many of you remember him as at Ariel's age. And Ed Sexsmith turned 80 and had a little celebration in the park yesterday. So we're honoring him. On Monday, Brittany Burke has a birthday, and Tuesday, Mark Aitchison is uh, not embarrassed for you to know that he's turning 70, and on Thursday, Clive Anderson, who's also here, is having a birthday, and uh, Clive will celebrate with you. So there's lots of seasons of life, and I guess that's what I love about the wisdom of our elders that we heard today, and the beauty of welcoming new ones into the community who also have uh, things for us to learn together, so. Um, and yesterday was a beautiful day for the Run for Refugees. They're almost at their $17,000 goal. So for those of you who knew walkers and runners, they're so close as we've had 40 years of walking with newcomers to Canada uh, in this community. So we hold space and celebrate the team that's been doing that together. There's a fun meat fundraiser for those of you who are preparing for winter and thinking about how you might feed family and neighbors, so look for that online. And in just a little while, at one o'clock, we're going to meet at Westine Park for uh, communion together outside before we return next week to in-person worship. And uh, for those of you who are itching to be here and have already registered online and are, have been fully prepared for the new way it's going to be and give up your favorite spot and where you're used to sitting because it will all be a little bit different, we welcome you back. And for those of you who don't feel ready, who are nervous or feel just grieving that it will feel different than it used to, it's okay to take your time to come. But there will be spots uh, at the 9.30 service and then at 11.15. 
or perhaps uh, there's someone in your life who uh, needs an invitation, who has been feeling lonely uh, or disconnected and may just need to come and be here. The gift of the way we're entering back in without singing and some of our other traditions is that it's a gentle way to enter in and just let the space and the leadership um, hold space for us to just be together in a safe way. So I look forward to that and I ask for buckets of grace from all of you as we figure it out. Jill and Tom who are still used to having perfect sound with just them and a few people will also be shifting into how it is to be together again. We do this because we're called to serve from a place of love and grace. We do this because we follow in the way of the one who gave his life for love. And so may this hymn call us to find ourselves on the journey, not alone, but together in every season. What is happening? Joan, oh, Joan, look, I'm totally in the, I'm like, there's people here. I really like going for it. Yeah, but I'm even more blessed before we sing to hear from Joan Hunter and her amazing team. Go for it. <laughs> this is a whole new process now. Um, I'm here to tell you a bit more about the Poverty Reduction Working Group. That's a brand new group in our church. It's not even as big as its name. We were formed last March, yeah, during COVID, as part of the social justice ministry. We are Clive Anderson, Mark Aitchison, Lynn Bullock, Donna Leslie, Lynn Valdegamo, and me, Joan Hunter. As we know and as we've heard this morning, poverty is a huge issue that we have begun casting about in to dis see if we can discover how we can be of help. We've been exploring all kinds of existing initiatives, some within the church, others in the community, so that we can make ourselves at least aware of the parts of this and hope to share what we learn with you eventually. One of the things we've learned so far is that this is just a first step, to become aware, then to educate ourselves, then to become advocates and eventually hopefully, as Lois has talked about, have some action somewhere down the line. There are many sides to look at. One of these is the guaranteed livable income that Lois has told us about, and there are many other ways, as you can imagine, of approaching it. We would love to have new members. Maybe you, <clears throat> like we, have been curious and disturbed by witnessing these incidences of resources being spread so unequally. Maybe you feel drawn to do something about this. Maybe you have had or are having a lived experience with poverty. Maybe you are new to Islington. Maybe you've been here many years. Maybe you're now a member of our virtual community as you hear this invitation. If it speaks to you, please get in touch with one of us or contact us through the church office. We would love to hear from you.
while you just to pause, remember that you're part of a community, whether we're gathering for worship next week in person or joining together online for the second part of our annual general meeting on the 27th at seven o'clock on Zoom, figuring out ways to make plans for the ministry ahead. Whether we're just trying to follow a little one, have her find a rest time in the middle of a busy day. God is with us. The God who's been with us since the beginning of creation. And the God who is known to us in the mystery of baptism. In the life of the one who risked for love. And in the presence of the Spirit that offers us good news. Go in peace. Amen.